Hi, my name is Luis Villa. I was the editor-in-chief of the 10th volume of the Columbia Law School Science and Technology Law Review, which was published in the 2008-2009 school year. Uh, the Columbia Science and Technology Law Review, which we call STLR, is a student-edited, student-run law review that focuses on uh, law and technology issues. So, for example, patent law, but also uh, patent law or biotechnology law, but also things like the application of technology to the law. How is technology changing law and its practice? When I became editor-in-chief, it was an obvious goal for me to push uh, for the journal to become open access if we thought we could do it uh, while still preserving our values of scholarship, academic integrity, things like that. And uh, so I started talking to the other editors and we looked at how we were already publishing. We were already publishing online and had been since day one. So it was um, so it was pretty easy for us to say, well, you know what, we're already sharing this with the world, let's do it in a formal way that says what our values are, not just in terms of academic integrity, but also in terms of spreading knowledge. Because really, I believe pretty firmly, and I think most of the rest of the staff believes pretty firmly, that knowledge is not something you should keep to yourself. That it's really something that uh, if it's only worthwhile if you share it with others. This doesn't really change anything for anyone who submits to our journal. The only positive change really for them is that we know from research in other fields that publication in open access journals, publication that's openly available on the web, increases your citation count. But otherwise, uh, the publication process should remain the same. In fact, since we're giving, since we're more explicitly giving all rights to the authors, uh, if anything, it makes the process easier because you have no worries about publishing on your own website, publishing on SSRN or other such places. We allow and in fact encourage you to put, publish the final edited version and not just preprints or pre-edited versions as is the norm for some other journals. Our business model as a journal is fairly unusual. We collect most of our revenue not from traditional subscriptions, but from Westlaw and Lexis, who are the two big search providers for academic and scholarly material in the legal field. So choosing to go open access, our biggest concern was, what do our contracts with these guys say? Uh, we knew it wasn't going to cut into our uh, subscription revenue, since we didn't have any. <laughs> Um, and in fact, we've seen research that says that even for people who do have subscription revenue, there's not an appreciable impact of going open access. Um, however, you know, the big concern for us was, can we legally do this? Are Westlaw and Lexus going to be troubled by it? Uh, and the answer was no. We understand that that's not always the case, that some older contracts do have exclusivity clauses, uh, but ours did not, perhaps because they're newer, because they're only 10 years old. Uh, and so we think, you know, they may, may well have some access, it may well have some impact. I mean, the reality is that many people are going to get to our articles now through Google instead of through Westlaw or Lexis. But we think that that's something that was only a matter of time in coming anyway, and we'd rather meet that challenge head on. As part of our move to open access, we're making an effort to become more fully integrated with the web, you could say. For example, we're going to take advantage of the Columbia Library's uh, academic commons area, and we're publishing through that. So we expect that, you know, as somebody said, if the island of Manhattan drops off the face of the internet and yet people are still looking for our articles, then uh, they'll be able to get to it because that information is stored uh, elsewhere. So we're making a move toward to really you know, that aspect of academic publishing, that that information always is going to be there, frankly, we didn't have before. And moving to, as part of the move to open access, we're taking care of that and making sure that our data really is permanent in the best sense uh, of the word. Open access on balance was fairly simple for us. Because of how we already published, because of what our revenue model was, the changes we made were, in many cases, licensing changes, rights changes, 
rather than pragmatic changes in how we published. Despite that, we still ran into some obstacles. There were people who said, really, can we do this? Uh, didn't know why, wanted to know how. Uh, so I can see how it would be challenging for some other journals to do it. But I think at the end of the day, the biggest hurdle from everyone I've talked to, both within my journal and at other journals, the biggest challenge is mental. The biggest challenge is saying, wow, this is different from how we've done it. Can you reassure me that this is a good idea? Can you reassure me that this is good for scholarship, that this is good for academia? Um, and those answers are, are the, good, the good news is, is that those answers are easier to provide than the technical ones. Those are the ones that scare people. But once you convince them that actually, you know, this is really good for knowledge, this is really good for your citation counts, this is good for you as a scholar, it's good for your ownership of the materials, uh, it's good for your control over your own publication. Once you convince people that all those things are there, and that's actually pretty easy to do once you talk to people, once you convince them of that, the other, the technological barriers, the business model barriers, those things can be dealt with.